morning. I believe that there are two categories of Christians, followers and disciples. We all start out our Christian life as followers, and that's exactly what Jesus called people to do, follow him. But somewhere along the line, we're all given an opportunity for this state to change. I remember an incident some years ago which changed my thinking about this forever. I was vacuuming my lounge one day when I heard a knock at the patio window and as I looked up, I saw a young woman waving to me from the other side of the glass. Morris and I had been conducting a crusade in Scotland a short time before and he'd invited this young woman to visit us at Barrett Ministries any time she wanted to come. she decided there and then that she was going to take him up on his offer and without thinking to let us know, arrived with her baggage on the doorstep with the intention of staying for a long weekend. As it happened, she was with us for three weeks. Well, it was a lovely sunny day when Mandy arrived, so I went into the garden and I invited her to sit with me to tell me her story. I'd never met her before, but her appearance told me that she was quietly spoken, sweet, gentle, very ladylike. Yet her story told me she'd come from a very different background altogether. And I could hardly believe what she was saying, although I knew she was telling me the truth. Mandy had delved quite deeply into witchcraft and drugs and had been a member of a motorbike chapter, something again to Hell's Angels. She'd done some despicable things in her past and hadn't been averse to casting spells on people. In fact, she and some of her mates had cast a spell on the assistant minister of the church where her parents were members, the very church we'd been invited to conduct our crusade. After ca casting this spell, they rang the assistant minister to tell him what they'd done and prophesied that he'd have a fatal car crash very soon. Obviously, he wasn't frightened by what they'd said and he told them he was under the protection of God and nothing they could do to him could harm him. But then he had a car crash. He wasn't killed, but he still had a car crash. Mandy's parents and the whole church kept her under special prayer, asking God to completely deliver her from all the things she was involved in. As Mandy wouldn't entertain any conversation whatsoever about Jesus Christ or God when her parents tried to speak to her, she was absolutely stunned to find herself inside the church her parents attended, when in actual fact she'd intended to be meeting a friend at the pub. From her own lips, she'd asked the taxi driver to take her to that particular church in Scotland. And even as she was telling me the story, I could see that she was still stunned that this had come from her own mouth, as she had no recollection whatsoever of even thinking it. But that was the day God had planned to meet Mandy. And she didn't leave the church until she was totally delivered. Her life was transformed. And that's an understatement. She was alive. She was burning for God and very spiritual aware indeed. Probably because of the spiritual involvement in other areas. She seemed to know without anybody telling her what was and wasn't acceptable. And because she'd enjoyed our ministry so much whilst attending our crusade in Scotland, she wanted to come and have personal fellowship with us so that she could be built up in her spiritual life. She wasn't yet filled with the Holy Ghost. And during the course of her time with us, she asked us on numerous occasions to pray that she would be, but nothing happened. Then on the very last night that she spent with us, God intervened and she opened her mouth to pour out the beautiful language that God had baptised her with in a really demonstrative way. Well, during her visit, I was working on an album, so I was recording in a secular professional recording studio. We took Mandy along with us, as I know it's very exciting for people to see a recording studio firsthand. Whilst we were there, she got into conversation with the directors who seemed so overwhelmed with her testimony that they actually invited her out to dinner. We were told later by one of them that he and the other directors who were husband and wife had listened to her story over their meal with rapt attention and amazement as she bore witness to them of what God had done for her. 
I know Mandy had made a big impression on them and was very grateful that God had sent her to us because for a long time we'd been sowing seeds at this recording studio and Mandy seemed to make a big statement. Well, from that time on, we kept in touch with her and she became a very close friend. She'd been such a blessing to have around that we invited her back the next year. Her visit coincided with bonfire night and at the recording studio, instead of having a Christmas party as other firms usually do, they had a bonfire night party to which they not only invited members of staff but all their clients who included radio and TV personalities and celebrities working in the entertainment field and Morris and myself were also invited. Because they'd heard that Mandy was with us, they said that we could bring her too. We saw this as a great opportunity because who knows what the Lord could have done on such a night as this. Well, the place was buzzing with people. And there was lots of food and drink for everybody. During the course of the evening, we got separated. Maurice and I were mingling with friends and Mandy, she got chatting with other people. It wasn't until a couple of hours later that one of the directors came to inform me that he'd put Mandy in a taxi and sent her back to our house as she was absolutely blind drunk and had been verbally abusing their most important clients. I could see from the expression on his face that Mandy's behaviour had been totally intolerable and both Morris and I were devastated at the outcome of the evening. We drove home from the party as quickly as we, uh, as we possibly could and found Mandy in the guest bedroom, totally inebriated. Being the woman, I felt it my duty to help her into bed and as I did so, she vomited all over the new quilt I'd just bought and the new carpet which had just been laid. I looked at her, totally disgusted and very angry. I went to bed myself some time later, but I couldn't sleep. I was so disturbed that I had to get up and go into the prayer room where I begged God and to answer why he'd allowed such a thing to happen. For years we'd been witnessing and living the life in front of these people at the studio and built up really good relationships and many of the barriers and defences had come down so that people could be honest with us and not be afraid to discuss deep and personal things. I knew that the directors had been really angry at what had taken place. They'd accepted Mandy because they respected Morris and I so much but I knew without any words being spoken by them that her behaviour that night was a direct reflection on us and I felt terribly embarrassed with the situation we'd been plunged into. I prayed aloud for quite a while but it seemed that the heavens were as brass and I couldn't get any peace of mind. Eventually, I decided to open the Bible at random and ask God to direct me to what I should read for my answer. I opened the Bible at Exodus 21 and I read the first few verses. If you buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh year he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl and he shall serve him forever. I couldn't for the life of me understand why God had directed me to such a scripture as it all seemed to be about a servant's attitude towards his master after a six-year period of service. If the slave had not enjoyed working for his master, he was entitled to go out free. <laughs> but if he decided he loved his master and wanted to stay, then his master was obliged to take him to the doorpost and pierce his ear through with an awl and put a ring in it. And this would be a sign to everybody that the slave was now there through his own choice, not because he'd been bought and had no say in the matter. 
I stared for ages at these verses, trying to understand what God was saying. And then suddenly, he gave me the revelation. I remembered what Mandy had told me about the way she'd become a Christian. As far as she was concerned, she hadn't even t intended to go to the church, let alone be delivered from all those terrible things she'd been involved with. For years, she'd been ruled by the devil. And then suddenly, God had intervened and given her a chance to see what it would be like to be ruled by him. It was now time for Mandy to make her own decision concerning whom she wanted to serve. She could either return to her former lifestyle and serve the devil again, or she could stay under God's protection and serve God forever. God had been very kind allowing her to see both camps, but it was her decision to say either, I will go out free or pierce my ear, Lord. God then began to remind me of my own past life, particularly concerning the incident I talked about in my last vlog where I'd been living a double life. And I realised that every single one of us at some point in our Christian walk has to make the decision for ourselves whether we'll serve God from choice or because we've been forced. So many things began to fall into place in my mind as to why God allows us to fall into sin and make stupid mistakes. Whatever condemnation and guilt I'd suffered up until that point was completely removed because I realised God needed to face me with the truth about myself, just like he was doing with Mandy, so that I could make a rational decision concerning my future. From the very moment that I made my decision that God could pierce my ear and have rights in my life, I know things have been very different. I'd made a wise choice. Who was I to condemn or criticise Mandy after God had shown such grace and mercy towards me? My attitude towards weak and struggling Christians has changed since God gave me that revelation. I try to be very careful not to condemn or judge now because I understand the process that has to take place in people's lives. We've all received so much forgiveness and grace from God. God arranged all the circumstances at the recording studio that night just to get Mandy's attention, just as he'd done with me in the testimony I shared with you last week. God could easily take care of those people at the studio who'd been offended by Mandy's behaviour, but his concern that night had been for Mandy to find out what she really did want deep down in her heart. When I shared this with her the next morning, what God had shown me, she reacted just like I had. She was sobbing with gratitude and she knew exactly which camp she wanted to be in. There was absolutely no contest. But God takes that risk with every single one of us. We could choose to go in the opposite direction. Nevertheless, God makes sure that we make our own decision without pressure from him because he's given us all a free will and he's after heartfelt love not forced love. God bless you.